This video, Engineering Principles of the Hinge, goes someplace that most tree felling videos don't, into the physical mechanics involved. In previous videos, we covered cutting the notch and the back cut. Those two operations leave the hinge. We will consider section AA later. A proper hinge provides two very important services. First, it is the task of the hinge to prevent the tree from falling sideways. In this video, we will look at the stresses that develop in the hinge to prevent the tree from falling sideways. Second, the step of the hinge is occasionally critical to preventing the butt from kicking back off the stump. This is almost never an issue if there is nothing to interfere with the tree's fall once it begins to go down. If the tree is not being felled into an open area, and particularly if the tree might fall against other trees, the situation becomes potentially dangerous. In this series of very simple illustrations, we can see one possible risk. First, tree A begins to fall, but makes contact with a similarly sized tree B. With its momentum still moving forward, tree A begins to bend. Feeling the load from tree A, tree B also begins to bend. As tree A continues to fall, and both trees continue to bend, a huge amount of spring energy is built up. This creates a huge force pushing the butt of tree A away from tree B. If the hinge tears, either due to bending or due to tension when the notch closes, only the step will be there to resist those spring forces. If the step is short and the splintered wood of the hinge moves above the step, there will be nothing left but friction to resist the spring force in the butt of tree A. The butt will then shoot back over the stump, sometimes as far as 10 or 15 feet. An excellent video of a similar event was captured and posted on YouTube by Kerfstock. The video is well annotated in Dutch. In this first image, the large oak is committed to its fall, but has contacted a much smaller tree, which is beginning to bend. In this second image, the smaller tree has a pronounced lean as the oak scrapes bark off its trunk. Note that what remains of the hinge has broken from the oak's stump. In this third image, the butt has moved back off the stump, and the crown of the oak is sliding down the well-inclined small tree. Focus on the near end of the oak. In this last image, the tree has kicked back around seven feet. Note also that this particular tree did not kick straight back from its direction of fall. It has actually followed the recommended 45 degree direction of retreat. This is one reason I usually try to retreat behind another tree, if one is available. When a tree kicks back, it could break your leg, and if you're really unfortunate, the tree could pin you down. Let's return to the primary purpose of the hinge, which is to keep the tree from falling sideways. Like this yardstick, the hinge is easy to bend across its thickness, but much harder to bend across its width. The typical hinge is eight times as wide as it is thick. Applying engineering mechanics, the typical hinge will have around eight times the strength to resist side lean that it does to resist falling in the desired direction. Let's consider the stresses involved in resisting side lean. Careful studies have shown that the distribution of stresses within a normal, well-balanced trunk is actually far from uniform. For simplicity, however, we will assume that the dead load and growth stresses are evenly distributed across the trunk. That stress will be approximated as the weight of the tree divided by the cross-sectional area of the trunk. For instance, 
Assume that a trunk with an area of 100 square inches supports a tree weighing one ton. The stress would be 2,000 pounds divided by 100 square inches or 20 pounds per square inch. When the notch and back cut are made, the supporting area is reduced to that of the hinge alone. This illustration shows two commonly recommended cutting patterns, one with a notch width equal to 80% of the tree's diameter and the other with a notch depth equal to one-third the tree's diameter. We'll do our analysis on the one with a notch depth equal to one-third the diameter. With this pattern, the hinge is just 16.33% of the area, or 16.33 square inches. With that reduction in support area, the pressure on the wood of the hinge is significantly increased. The same 2,000 pound tree is now supported on just 16.33 square inches. This increases the stress on the hinge to 2,000 divided by 16.33 is equal to 122 psi, roughly six times as great. Now let's look at a section AA up through the hinge. The arrows represent the uniform 122 psi of pressure the tree is exerting in the hinge. Now let's consider that the tree is not well balanced side to side. Let's assume that its center of gravity is two feet to the left of the center of the stump, either due to lean or to extra branches on that side of the tree. Applying the tree's 2,000 pound weight to that two foot moment arm yields a bending moment of 4,000 foot pounds. This means that an additional compressive pressure will be applied to the left side of the notch. That bending moment will also put some tension into the right side of the tree. Assuming a straight line distribution of the bending forces and taking into consideration the width and thickness of the hinge, the bending stresses applied to the hinge will vary from 92.9 psi compression to 92.9 psi tension. If we superimpose the bending stresses of the 122 psi dead load stresses, we see that the stresses on the left side of the hinge increase to roughly 216 psi, while the compression on the right side is reduced down to just 29 psi. If we assume the center of gravity is actually four feet from the center of the trunk, the bending stresses are doubled to almost 186 psi in compression and tension on the ends of the hinge. If these larger stresses are superimposed on the initial 122 psi dead load, the compression on the left of the hinge increases to 308 psi, while the right end of the hinge feels tension to the tune of 64 psi, which we will designate as a negative pressure, minus 64 psi. At this point, the hinge's pull to hold this tension is critical to keeping the tree from falling sideways. Surprisingly, on the small scale, wood cells are actually stronger in tension than in compression. However, while the cells may actually crush, on a larger scale, the crushed cells can distribute their load broadly, and the crushed mass can provide a great deal of reserve compression resistance when backed by a stump below and a tree trunk above. The critical factor then becomes the tensile capacity of the portion of the hinge in tension. The tensile stress will be increased if the hinge is thinned by additional cutting on the back cut or if the imbalance of the tree is greater. When that tensile stress is high enough the wood begins to fail in tension, it separates, and it has no reserve capacity. In a nutshell, that is how a hinge 
prevents a tree from falling sideways. Before leaving the subject, however, there is an interesting point to consider about a hinge that is nearing failure in tension. Note that at point N, the stress is equal to zero, as the tree is exerting neither compression nor tension on the hinge at that point. If neither stress is being exerted, the hinge at that point is making no contribution to keeping the tree from falling sideways. Taken a step farther, that portion of the hinge is not needed and could be cut away. As a matter of fact, the portion of the hinge with only low levels of stress is not particularly needed either as it is close to the neutral axis and doesn't provide a lot of moment resistance. Furthermore, the lost compression can easily be made up by additional compression on the left end of the hinge. The reason this is significant is that the middle third of the hinge's width can be cut out without significantly reducing the hinge's ability to resist falling to the side. Cutting through this portion of the hinge is fairly common in European practice. This is often done when a saw's blade is not long enough to extend all the way to the desired back of the hinge in the middle of the tree. There are two additional reasons why cutting out the middle third of the hinge might be warranted. On a large trunk, initiating a fall requires overcoming two forces. One is the weight of the tree. If the tree's center of gravity is well behind the hinge, it can take a lot of force to lift that weight. The second force is the strength of the hinge itself. Assuming it is 11 and a half inches wide and an inch and a half thick, trying to get a hinge to bend is equivalent to trying to break a piece of 2 by 12 lumber. On an even larger tree, the hinge will be even harder to get to bend. By reducing the width of the hinge by a third, that effort can be reduced by a third. The second reason for cutting out the middle third of the hinge has to do with logging for lumber. When a hinge breaks, some of the whiskers that remain on the stump can be around a foot long. These have been pulled out of the butt of the trunk, leaving holes that will generally not be tolerated in finished lumber. Cutting through the middle third of the hinge will eliminate the possibility of whiskers being pulled out from the center of the log. This video has looked at stress distribution along the length of the hinge. Things actually get more complicated when we look at stress distribution across the thickness of the hinge as the tree begins to fall. Those important considerations will be looked at in the upcoming video, Limits of Hinge Performance.